Today we have an online educational event by the European School of Urology, and the title, as you can see, is the Minimal Invasive Treatment for Male Labs, Novel Armamentarium. This is really a hot topic for our uh, works. And it's a pleasure and an honor to share this course with Dr. Neil Barber from UK and Dr. Vincent Misray from France. In particular, Dr. Uh, Neil Barber is uh, uh, the director of the Family BPH Research Center, while uh, uh, Dr. Misray is a urologist at the, the clinic uh, Pastor. So we have uh, a big program to be uh, performed in just one hour. And as you can see, we start from the conventional uh, event like uh, uh, ablation and resume and urolift. And then we move to uh, the eye team and the prostatic injection. Finally, we uh, evaluate what are the place of these new technologies against the daily clinical practices, so against the gold standard, and then we discuss uh, everything uh, together. So uh, I ask to Ms. Ray to start with his presentation. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I'm Vincent Misray. And I'm delighted to, to be uh, here with you uh, today with this new ed edition of Euro we webinar. Um, and I would like to thank uh, the sponsor Teleflex uh, to um, uh, support uh, this webinar under the patronage of European School of Theology. And my duty uh, today is to present you some of the mini, um, minimally invasive uh, surgical techniques uh, for male LUTs to treat benign prosthetic obstruction. So first of all, my uh, disclosures. So to, to introduce finally the um, this uh, mini invasive uh, surgical technologies where uh, we are surrounded by uh, mini invasive uh, uh, technologies. Um, not so long time ago, the uh, management of BPO was uh, quite easier. So TRP for prostate less than 80 and open simple prostatectomy for uh, prostate over 80. So now we have a lot of choice and patients have a, a, a lot of choice, but um, to uh, make things clear, I would like just to introduce um, this tremendous, this outstanding work, work uh, recently published in uh, European Urology uh, on uh, what man prefers at time, when time comes to uh, choice, to, to choose a, a surgical technique to treat uh, benign prostatic obstruction and lots uh, related to uh, benign prostatic obstruction. So what this uh, uh, outstanding uh, study uh, conclude that men prefer low risk management option that have fewer side sexual side effects. So this is a kind of trade, a kind of trade off when you consider a patient. So uh, there is a sequential treatment. So from the medical therapies to mini invasive therapies and then to surgical treatment, uh, ablative treatment, surgical options. So the more you will desobstruct, of course, the more the patient will have to deal with some side effects, including uh, sexual uh, effects and um, ejaculation uh, dysfunction. So first, first of all, here are the challenges uh, new uh, uh, mini invasive technologies to challenge TRP, uh, the oldest gold standards, um, uh, and open simple prostatectomy. So we have, we will start with uh, water. So water is uh, a new so energy source, uh, including uh, aqua ablation and uh, resume, so vapor water therapy. And then we will present uh, some of the aspects of the, uh, these new technologies. So first, aquablation is a relatively new technology. Um, so few, several, uh, few, few level one study are now available in the literature. So briefly, the technology, the, the technique uh, consists in introducing a, 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 an ultrasound, a transsexual ultrasound to monitor uh, the uh, uh, surgical ablative uh, treatment uh, with a robot. It's a semi-autonomous surgical procedure with a robot, and the water jet will shave, uh, will ablate the prosthetic tissue um, according to surgeon mapping. So if the surgeon wants to 
treat all the transitional zone is completely possible, feasible. And if the surgeon and the patient would like to uh, keep, uh, to preserve uh, antegrad ejaculation, it's completely feasible. And the patient, the, the surgeon just have to map according to patient preference. So here is uh, the uh, results of the three years outcomes uh, published uh, recently. This is the water study. So I, I'm pleased to, to have, uh, we are pleased to have Neil Barber in the, in the, 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 the expert uh, today uh, in the expert panel. Uh, and you know, Neil was in, uh, in the authorship uh, of this fantastic study. So this is a randomized control study, blinded study, uh, compare aquablation and TURP. So this is the three years outcome presenting on, on, on the, presented on this slide. So we can see that at three years, uh, there is no significant difference in terms of IPSS, of course, and uh, quality of life. Uh, so IPSS question eight. So very, very uh, close. Uh, uh, Turp and aquabation uh, provided uh, very similar results uh, at three years. Um, so in terms of QMAX, it's again, uh, non-significant, but maybe a, a small decrease for uh, uh, aquablation in, some, in terms of QMAX, PVR was exactly the same. So now the complication and the side effects. So uh, this is a recall of the uh, three months uh, rate outcomes uh, uh, that was recalled in the, the papers uh, published uh, the, three year, the three years outcomes. So we can see that uh, in terms of sexual uh, uh, erectile, uh, erectile dysfunction, we have exactly the same result. So zero erectile, erectile dysfunction and a slight difference between uh, TURP and aquablation uh, in terms of ejaculation dysfunction. So more dry ejaculation after TURP than for aqua ablation. So regarding the sexual function, uh, we have a nice paper published uh, in the literature by the Cochrane uh, Library, so, uh, published by Wong and uh, colleagues, not not so uh, long time ago, uh, and they stated that there was no little no uh, difference or little difference in terms of erectile dysfunction compared to uh, 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 standard procedure, and a small improvement, but uh, just a small improvement in preservation of ejaculatory function. So, as it's a new procedure, uh, aquablation. Um, in fact, we need some uh, uh, to improve the settings to preserve ejaculation, of course. And again, it's a trade-off between the uh, 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 rate of disobstruction, uh, the quality of the disobstruction, and uh, the preservation of integral ejaculation. So this trade-off and this cutoff, in fact, uh, could be improved. And um, uh, and. And we and, and colleagues published a very nice paper uh, in urology uh, very recently to improve the settings of the machine um, uh, to increase the uh, rate of uh, ejaculation preservation in such uh, patients. So the limitation of this uh, uh, technique, the, the aquablation, um, has been highlighted by uh, EAU guidelines in, in, in EAU guidelines, um, mainly, mainly in regards with the uh, biddings and the risk of uh, transfusion. In fact, water is not the best energy source to make the hemostasis, uh, you know, we guess that. So um, many authors tried to uh, provide some tips and tricks to improve the quality of the hemostasis. Um, and uh, I, I, in fact, they published that making the coterie, making a coterie at the level of the blood and neck uh, could improve the quality of the hemostasis. But the robust traction that was published initially with this technique, we put a catheter and then we tracked on the catheter to uh, compress the uh, prostatic fossa and to decrease the risk of uh, bleeding complication was not a significant uh, 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 improvement. Uh, and of course, what uh, has been published in the paper uh, uh, in the BGU uh, a year ago by Elterman and uh, colleagues was that if the if the prostate is the prostate uh, the bigger is the prostate in fact uh, the more the patient is at risk to um, uh, 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 present uh, on the postoperative outcomes bleedings. Uh, of course, the, the the less the hemoglobin is uh, at the at baseline and the 
more the patient will be at risk to be transfused. Again, the resection time, the, the more, the, the longer is the resection time when you, you can do one pass, two pass, three passes. And then if you increase the number of passes, you put the patient at risk to uh, 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 present some uh, bleeding complications, including, including uh, 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 bladder uh, clothes, uh, retention and transfusion. So the overall uh, rate of transfusion published in this paper was roughly four, five, uh, 4%. Which is not so uh, high, but uh, uh, this could be uh, significant, uh, considered as uh, significant. And again, we don't have, as it's a new technology, uh, a long uh, term follow up. So we don't know uh, the number of patients that will be uh, reoperated. But it's, again, it's a trade off when you consult the patient. You say, okay, I can pre preserve you the ejaculation uh, and get rid of medical uh, therapies, but we don't know when you could be reoperated uh, because of Lutz recurrence and the uh, uh, prostate. Uh, tissue, adenomatous tissue regrowth. So what is the statement in the EAU guidelines? So uh, it is effective and um, it is uh, 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 um, non-inferior to uh, TURP subjectively and objectively, but there are some concerns about the methods to do a proper and uh, hemostasis of quality. So the recommendation is Offering the patient aquablation is okay, but for prostates between 30 and 80, because there is no evidence to support aquablation over uh, 80 grams, despite uh, some uh, uh, study recently uh, published, but retrospective or monocentric or uh, single arm studies. So with a very limited uh, uh, level of evidence. And we should inform the patients about the risk of bleeding and uh, consult the patient taking oral anticoagulants or anti-thrombotic uh, agents, generally speaking, uh, not to uh, go through this uh, uh, procedure. So one of the uh, uh, surgical techniques, mean invasive technique, using water, but uh, this time, this is a uh, 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 vapor, uh, water under vapor. So this is the resume uh, therapy. So briefly, the resume consists in introducing a pistol uh, inside the urethra. And in this pistol, you have a needle and the needle will inject into the prostatic tissue, uh, the, uh, the transitional zone uh, during few seconds, uh, a vapor under pressure, uh, nine seconds approximately. And then you can repeat the function inside the transitional zone to treat uh, the, the, the prostate. Uh, according to the size, of course. Um, one, only one RCT uh, has published the results uh, on uh, uh, roughly 200 men against sham. So there is a concern uh, in the guidelines that this kind of technology appeared on the market and the, there is a, a delay, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, between the, 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 uh, uh, the release of this technology and their assessments. Uh, clinical assessment. So this uh, study recently published uh, has shown that against SHAM, um, Resume had provided favorable, favorable outcomes. Uh, so at two years and four years, but we have no RCT against uh, reference treatment. But again, it's a very attractive treatment because it's very short. It is repeatable. Uh, so it's a very nice technique again. So one another uh, a prospective study, but single arm study, uh, roughly 700 uh, patients, providing very nice uh, uh, results on patient with a decrease of Qmax, uh, no, a decrease of, uh, sorry, uh, IPSS, uh, increase of Qmax, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and a decrease of uh, prosthetic volume. The patient get rid of the uh, indwelling catheter uh, roughly after uh, three uh, days. Uh, and what is uh, to be noticed is that there was absolutely no influence on the sexual function, no worse uh, uh, influence. Uh, so IF5 did not vary significantly as follow-up, which is a good thing. And antegrad ejaculation was maintained uh, in 80 uh, 90 sorry, percent of the patients. So 
it's very uh, uh, again uh, what patients are searching for uh, uh, is technology which could preserve uh, sexual function and resume or acquisition could provide such a goal for the patient. So um, to, to, to summarize uh, the, the data uh, for the resume, um, some of the disadvantages is the, 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 the catheter. And sometimes uh, the patient has to keep the catheter according to the prostate size uh, up to one or two weeks. Despite in the previous study, uh, it was uh, an average of three days. Um, patients encounter generally uh, on the post-operative outcomes on the days or the weeks following the procedures, a dysuria, storage symptoms, uh, because the, uh, the, there is a delay uh, uh, between the treatment and the efficacy and the necrosis uh, and the prosthetic enlargement, uh, the, 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 the urethra, sorry, uh, 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 enlargement. Uh, and uh, for patients uh, in chronic retention, uh, we have a, a rate uh, of failure uh, uh, of try uh, without uh, uh, catheter uh, and some infections complications, including sepsis, uh, epidemic, orchitis, et cetera, et cetera. Very, very, very limited uh, bleeding complication. So uh, advantages are uh, very simple. It's a repeatable technique, so you can repeat, resume. If it failed, of course, zero stress incontinence reported on the post-operative outcomes. Uh, Patients are usually operated in uh, day case surgery. Uh, this is a very short operative time, um, uh, and it preserves again uh, uh, the, the, the sexual function. So I let I let the the, 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 the microphone to Neil Barber. Uh, before we get going, though, I'd just like to add that um, there is now, um, I've just seen site as a author in the water study, which was the randomized trial of, of TURP versus ablation. We've now seen the five-year data, which basically is unchanged from that from the third-year data that uh, uh, Professor Mizrai presented, um, which is all good news. So hopefully now if we can uh, play the, uh, the recorded one, that'd be great. Hello, my name is Neil Barber, a consultant neurologist from uh, the UK, and it's a pleasure to speak today uh, at this ESU online webinar regarding the prostatic urethral lift procedure, otherwise known as Eurolift. So what is the Eurolift? Well, Eurolift uh, was really the first of the uh, return of the so-called minimally invasive surgical treatments uh, as an intervention for symptomatic BPH. There had been some um, similar type approaches in terms of being less invasive in the less 90s, which didn't stand the test of time, but it was really the arrival of Eurolift which had changed the conversation again. Uh, the idea of this procedure is to use uh, implants to compress the prostatic tissue uh, away from the midline, opening up the prostatic urethra to reduce resistance, reduce obstruction and improve symptoms. The attraction of this procedure is it can be performed under local anaesthesia as well as sedation or general anaesthetic uh, and that the majority of men, some 80% plus, uh, may undergo the procedure without the need for post-optive urinary catheter. It is therefore quick, uh, it can be performed as a day case, uh, the patient or even on an ambulatory basis. Uh, and as uh, there is no cutting or cooking, uh, the post-operative uh, symptoms settle themselves down quickly and we see a rapid return to normal activity. Patients see the symptom improvement uh, without the burden of risk of any impact upon sexual function at all, uh, with no risk of new dry ejaculation or indeed even ejaculatory dysfunction and no impact upon erectile function. This animation here demonstrates the concept of what uh, the Eurolift procedure is all about. So as I say, either under some form of anesthetic, be it general or under deep sedation, or even uh, using a local anesthetic protocol, which we'll go through later, the procedure starts with the insertion of a 20 French cystoscope. This is a specialized device to hold uh, the delivery uh, device of the Eurolift system itself. The principle is uh, compression of the prostate with the tip 
of the uh, cystoscope sheath and device to open up the prostatic urethra. The device is then fired, delivering a needle through the prostate to the outside of the prostate, ca prostate capsule. The needle then is retracted, and this leaves the urolift implant in place and holding that prostatic urethra apart. The implants are delivered essentially in pairs, starting at the bladder neck and working uh, one's way back towards the apex. And on average, four implants are delivered in the average size prostate. And here's the fourth going in towards the apex. And the idea is to open up the prostate to an extent that will allow reduce in, uh, a reduction in resistance and hence symptom improvement. The urolift implant itself is made up of three parts. There's the capsula tab, that bit which is pulled back onto the prostatic uh, capsule, uh, which is made of nitinol and in its total length is 13 millimeters. There's then a polyethylene suture, uh, which is uh, under tension through the prostate. And on the urethral side, there is a urethral end piece, which is eight millimeters long, made of stainless steel. The system itself is made up of this gun, for want of a better word. Uh, to start off, you need to unlock the safety. You fire the blue lever, which delivers the needle through the prostate, and then pull both the blue and grey one back, which retrieves that needle, leaving the uh, implant behind, drawing that, the capsular tab onto the outside of the prostate and achieving tension through the suture. With the button on the end, the suture is cut and the urethral end piece delivered, much like uh, a clothesline peg. The idea of the procedure itself is to create a, an anterior channel through the prostate from the blood net through to the apex. So you're aiming then to deliver your implant in the upper third of the prostatic urethra as you're looking at it endoscopically. And it's important during the delivery of the implant uh, that uh, the uh, device itself is kept parallel with the floor. So you're firing basically at 90 degrees. If you try and fire too anteriorly, then you have a chance of hitting bone, uh, which will affect delivery of the implant, and indeed failure thereof. You start then by identifying uh, a keyhole in the device, which is marked here, uh, and placing that at the bladder neck. You then move away from the bladder neck towards the apex one and a half centimeters before delivering the first implant. Here we show a video of this. The surgeon there, you can see the device is parallel to the floor and he's coming back away from the bladder neck, one and a half centimeters. He then angles the device, compressing the prostate, opening the urethra anteriorly, fires with the blue lever. That's the needle through the prostate, then pulling both the blue and gray together back, retrieving that needle and leaving the implant there under tension. Then move forward slowly, straightening up that suture so that the urethral uh, end piece is delivered at 90 degrees and therefore is secure and maintains that tension. And you're looking for a white line uh, to tell you when things are straight, so press that button. You then change that device for another one and continue to place a uh, implant on the other side uh, in a similar location. You then move back towards the distal prostate or towards the apex, and you're looking for the very Montanum as your landmark. Again, here we have a video of this. See how the device remains parallel to the ground, and you're minimizing contact with the tissue as much as possible to keep bleeding down and maintain good vision. Having identified the very Montanum, you then kiss it with the tip of the device to ensure good location. And again, compress the prostate and the prostate urethra laterally. 20 degrees is what you're aiming for there in terms of angulation. Pull the blue lever, firing the needle, blue and gray back, retrieving the needle, leaving the implant, and then move forward slowly, maintaining that compression until that white line is seen. Just coming to view there, press the button, which cuts and applies that urethral end piece. 
As I mentioned, this procedure can be performed under pure local anaesthetic. And in fact, this is commonplace, particularly in the United States, where office urologists will perform this in their office. This does uh, often involve giving some kind of sedation, such as diazepam. So how effective is this procedure? Well, as I say, it's been around some time, and this was the, not the first study, but the first proper randomized study, uh, the so-called LIFT study, which was uh, required by the FDA for its for approval, and was a randomized study of Eurolift against sham. All of these procedures being performed under pure local anesthesia. As you can see here, the Eurolift uh, procedure achieves significant and rapid improvements in symptoms with uh, over 40% improvement IPSS within the first month. And this is maintained out, as you can see here, for four years. And indeed, in the fifth year as well, uh, demonstrating longevity of this procedure or durability of the procedure uh, with a low retreatment rate at 2 to 3% per year. As I mentioned, there's been a whole host of studies relating to this device. There were the first uh, single centre and multi-centre prospective studies of Chin and McNicholas, uh, the former in Australia and the second in Europe, followed by the LIFT study, that randomised study against SHAM, uh, published by Rurburn in 2016. Uh, and on top of that, there was also a prospective randomised trial versus TURP, known as BPH6, uh, published by Gratz Gertau in 2016. The point of this slide is to demonstrate that all those studies demonstrate exactly the same pattern of significant improvement in symptom score. And they all demonstrated that this improvement was durable. So we have reproducible results from this minimally invasive procedure with high quality uh, data from two randomized studies as well as multi-centered prospective studies. And it's meant uh, that this weight of evidence, this body of evidence uh, that uh, Eurolift has been incorporated to the guidelines of the various bodies. It has strong recommendation in the latest EAU guidelines on the management of non-neurogenic male urinary tract symptoms with evidence level 1B. Uh, and that's for prostates measuring up to 70 mils with no evidence for middle load because men with middle loads were excluded from all those studies. The same is true from the AUA with guidelines related to prostate volumes of up to 80 mils uh, with a pre without the presence of an obstructive middle lobe. And accreditation has also been gained from NICE uh, in the UK. As such, then the prostatic relief lift procedure or Eurolift is unique in the level of evidence and recommendations that it has in the field of these minimally invasive surgical treatments that you're hearing about today. As regards men there with obstructive middle lobes, well, with, with advanced techniques, and indeed there are some new devices coming along, these two, in fact, can, can be treated, although you do need to be experienced. MedLift was a, a prospective multi-centered trial in the US for the FDA, recruiting 45 men with obstructive middle lobes. And you can see here that the outcome in terms of symptom improvement followed exactly the same pattern as we'd seen with men without obstructive middle lobes in both the LIFT study uh, and um, in other studies. Data has been collected retrospectively from over 2,000 men from centers all around the globe. And if one looks at men who were treated with middle lobes within that real world data, then again, you see exactly the same pattern of improvement in symptoms in men with middle lobes as we saw in the MedLift study, but also as we saw in the LIFT study for those without middle lobes. And if one analyzed uh, those patients with only obstructive lateral lobes in that real world data. So now we have data to confirm not only the efficacy and the reproducibility of Eurolift generally, but also uh, that is equivalent in men with obstructive middle lobes, both in uh, data from those tightly controlled trials with, with strict inclusion criteria, but also from real world data from around the globe in large numbers. What about men in urinary retention? Well, there was a prospective multi-centered trial in the UK, Pulsar, uh, which looked at uh, data from six UK sites of 52 men uh, in acute urinary retention. Prostate volumes had to be less than 100 mils, and they had to at least failed one uh, trial without catheter uh, whilst on an alpha blocker. At the end of 12 months, 73% of men recruited to that trial remained catheter independent. Furthermore, if we look at that 
uh, global retrospective data set again, and we look at men within that who were in urinary retention, we see uh, the same kind of improvements in IPSS in those patients as we did in the Pulsar study. And what's more, if anything, there was a higher rate of being catheter three at the end of a year at 84%. So there is a huge amount of high quality data relating to uh, patients undergoing the urinary procedure, uh, it, including those with middle lobes and including those in retention. And we see over and over the same pattern of, of speed of improvement in symptoms, level of improvement in those symptoms, and indeed longevity with that data is collected. And remember, all this is achieved with repeatedly no evidence of negative impact upon sexual function, be it ejaculatory, that is that totally normal antiquated ejaculation is maintained and no impact upon erectile function. So in 2022, who may be suitable for this uh, minimally invasive surgical treatment, the Eurolift? Well, it's men with mild to moderate lonely tract symptoms with prostate volumes up to a maximum of 70 or to 100 mils, uh, in, uh, depending which um, criteria one follows. It can be effective in those with middle lobes using advanced techniques, and indeed soon there'll be available some uh, alternative devices. And we can see that it is also reasonably successful in men presenting with acute urinary retention. Many thanks for your attention. Yep, thank you. So we move to um, another mechanical device. Another, me oh, sorry, yep. Another mechanical device, uh, which is the um, ITIN. Um, the ITIN is a, a nitinol device uh, which will be uh, placed uh, into the uh, prostatic urethra under generally under local anesthesia. So we have a nice um, pilot study involving uh, 32 patients uh, and published in the BGY uh, into, uh, in 2019. Uh, so this is a nitinol device placed. Uh, into the, 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 the prostatic uh, urethra, and uh, it will expand uh, the prostatic urethra and leads to some um, a necrosis uh, a mechanism uh, to enlarge, of course, the urethra and to be um, turp-like, um, which is the goal of this uh, device. Uh, and it leads, usually lead in the pilot study to change from baseline IPSS and quality of life score and QMAX, and these changes uh, were considered to be uh, significant, but again, it was ex exclusively only a, a, a pilot study with uh, uh, only a limited number of uh, patients. So um, the authors reported few uh, complications, including uh, urinary retention, transient incontinence due to the device uh, migration uh, into the, 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 the prostate fossa through uh, the apex. Um, and some urinary, urinary tract infection, which, which uh, are common uh, 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 post-operative uh, complication in the outcomes uh, in endourology. So the latest, latest uh, data uh, regarding etine, and again, again, this is highlighted in the European Urology guidelines uh, in the LUTs uh, surgical management. So these. Studies are randomized, of course, controlled trials, but uh, against sham. And uh, studies, uh, randomized studies against uh, standard techniques are awaiting, are ongoing, uh, expected, uh, 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 maybe in the, the following years. Um, so this study against sham showed at one year favorable outcomes and roughly 80% of the patient in the ITIN arms showed a re reduction of three points of IPSS, which could be considered as uh, clinically uh, debatable uh, because this is only three points, but it was significant versus sham. And only 60% six, uh, uh, of patients in the uh, sham control arms uh, 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 reported uh, this endpoint of uh, reduction of three points of uh, EP, IPSS. So this is a, 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 a relatively new technique, which could be assessed more accurately uh, uh, against uh, standard treatment, but again, comparing a mini-invasive surgical treatment to standard treatment is 
may be uh, debatable, but we will discuss about that later uh, uh, on the web in the webinar. So the advantages of uh, e times are the, 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 the there is no requirement for uh, general anesthesia, which could be uh, considered as an advantage. Uh, so this is an, an ambulatory uh, uh, procedure, so no major complications recorded to date. Sexual function, which is the goal, uh, were, was preserved. Um, so in terms of erectile function and integral ejaculation. Uh, so there, this is not an ablative uh, uh, treatment. So you expand, there is a small necrosis, but you conserve, you, you preserve uh, the uh, structure, the, the anatomical structure. There is no thermal or uh, 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 electronic, electric or laser eating uh, uh, damage, no ionizing radiation, etc. And the learning curve is quite short, but again, with a limited uh, number of patients and studies uh, are not uh, 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 with, uh, published with a high level of evidence. So, Cons uh, and pros, so we have the cons, the disadvantages. So we have the limited data, no long-term data, of course, because it's a very new uh, uh, techniques. And uh, only uh, the results were only reported uh, in highly experienced uh, center. So could it be transposed in the, uh, uh, every uh, centers all over the world? This, it's unknown, uh, maybe yes according to this preliminary data. And again, there are no cost data available. We all know that uh, the, the, the economic uh, uh, system is completely different from a country to another, but we should consider this device uh, and the, 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 the cost effectiveness of each of the device in uh, the uh, strategy to offer to this patient this kind of uh, uh, procedure. So the last and uh, a really short and brief uh, brief uh, overview of intraprostatic botulinum toxin, which is no longer uh, recommended in the EAU guidelines. So uh, this is the uh, easiest part of my presentation. So intraprostatic botulinum toxin was promising uh, years uh, ago, but in fact, the results are very disappointing and the recommendation of the EAU guidelines are really a crystal clear. So do not offer intraprostatic uh, botulinum toxin injections for patients to treat male LUTs. So this is clear, and this is a strong recommendation not to offer this uh, 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 procedure to this patient because of the uh, low efficacy uh, uh, of this procedure. And I end my presentation on this slide. So the discussion is open now with the with you, uh, Neil. Sorry. Yes, thank you very much, Vincent. Uh, uh, I think that this is a uh, very important. Uh, you have joined to uh, Neil for the last presentation that is maybe the most important of this session because uh, the question is where, what is the place uh, of these technologies against actual gold standards? So we see between uh, medication and standard surgical procedure. But Neil, please tell us what is your point of view. So we've heard about the different uh, new so-called minimum invasive surgical treatments available uh, for the treatment of men with symptomatic BPH, uh, both a minimum invasive and perhaps more invasive. And we now ask the question as to what place these new technologies may have when measured against the actual gold standards. So in 2022, I think we it's simplest to look at the options available in two broad groups. We have the so-called cavitating or receptive approaches, which one would consider the gold standard method to relieve obstruction and improve symptoms. And we've heard about these minimally invasive surgical treatments as an alternative. And essentially, I think they sit in two separate camps. If we look at the, uh, so the standard receptive approach, of course, the mainstay is the TURP, which has been around for many decades. 
This too has seen some improvements in terms of technology with the arrival of bipolar uh, equipment and particularly the plasma uh, Turis system uh, from Olympus. This has seen greater improvements in terms of reduction of bleeding both during and after the procedure, leading to shortened uh, inpatient stay, shortened in, uh, indwelling time of the postoperative catheter, and even in many centres, particularly in the UK, this is being performed on a day case basis as a result. At the turn of the millennium, we saw the maturation of the laser technology in terms of surgery for symptomatic BPH particularly initially the evolution of the enucleation technique using the Holmium laser developed by uh, Gilling and Fraundorfer, and subsequently the arrival of the green light laser system performing photoselective vaporization of the prostate, again to remove tissue to create a wide cavity through the prostate uh, in a, a very hemostatic manner. And as we know, uh, other technology can be used to enucleate tissue, much like the originally described HOLEP, including the use of the thulium laser, but also, in fact, the bipolar technology as well. All these procedures lead to similar improvements in symptoms and in terms of maximum flow rate. And we know they all have low or very low re-intervention rates over a period of time. This approach is and will remain the most effective approach in terms of level of symptom improvement. These are good operations, therefore. However, like all operations, they have their downsides. In most centers, they uh, will involve an inpatient stay of a night, two, or even three. They will usually require the insertion of postoperative urinary catheter, often a three-way catheter with irrigation. And there's a risk of established uh, peri and post op complications relating to bleeding, issues with clots, urinary tract infections, and post-operative storage type symptoms. These, these symptoms can uh, lead to delay in symptom resolution, often measured we in weeks and for some in a month or two. And this in itself can re delay return to normal activities. Above all, however, they all carry a significant risk of negative impact upon sexual function, with variable risks of permanent dry ejaculation from 50% upwards, and a smaller figure, but nevertheless a real figure, of a potential negative impact upon erectile function. So if we look at these minimally invasive surgical treatments that we've discussed today, including the Eurolift, Resume, and ITIN in particular, what do they have to offer? Well, as has been described, they are quick procedures taking 15, 20 minutes. They can be performed as a day case with rapid discharge from hospital and even under local anesthetic in the office environment. For Eurolift and ITIND, there is the expectation that no post-operative urinary catheter will be required. And they all hope to promise the patient a rapid return to normal activity in days and weeks rather than the weeks and months of the standard resecting or cavitating procedures. Furthermore, they also carry the promise of little or indeed no risk of negative impact upon sexual function, be it ejaculatory or erectile. However, on the other side of the coin, they have their downside. The level of expected improvement in IPSS and flow rate is less than one would expect with the resecting or cavitating surgeries, significantly less one might argue. And because one is doing less, and although the figures look good, certainly for Eurolift and Resume, one would expect realistically less durability in terms of outcome. I'll talk a little about a bit about aquablation therapy separately, I think, from this. As we have heard already, this is a novel procedure using real-time ultrasound image guidance to plan and contour the procedure in a way which is personalized to the shape of that patient's prostate. The procedure is delivered robotically, bringing in reproducibility in a way which we haven't seen before. And fundamentally, it is a heat-free procedure using a high-pressure water jet to both resect and ablate tissue to create a wide cavity through the prostate. So whilst aquablation often falls in, into discussions regarding minimally invasive surgical treatments, it actually really is a cavitating or receptive approach. 
And as such, we see in the trial so far, the kind of outcomes in terms of symptom improvement that we would hope to see from such a receptive approach. This slide shows overlapping data uh, from three uh, aquablation studies. The first was water, a prospective global multi-centered double blind randomized trial versus TURP with prostate volumes in 30 to 80 mils. Water 2, which was a prospective multi-centered trial in the US looking at prostate volumes of 80 to 150 mils. And open water, which was an off-label prospective multi-centered trial uh, in Europe looking at all comers essentially and therefore prostate volumes ranging from 20 to 150 mils and in fact also included men in urinary retention. And as we can see in all those studies, aquablation led to exactly the same kind of uh, improvement in symptoms that we saw in the TURP group in that randomized water trial. And as, we, as, as I said before, we would expect to see in receptive or cavitated procedures. And we can compare the outcome then to what you would expect in terms of symptom improvement with medical therapy and the minimally invasive surgical or non-receptive treatments of Urolift and Resume and indeed ITIND. So this clearly places aquaplation, at least in terms of outcome, in the same uh, bracket as the standard or gold standard approaches. And what data we have, which is three-year data from two of those trials, suggests this is achieved with a uh, reasonable durability and a low re-intervention rate over at least three years. If we put all those studies together, indeed add in data from a prospective study in France, that was called Francais water, uh, looking at patients with prostate volumes then up to 150 mils, and in patients with all shapes of prostate, with many of them having a middle lobe element. We see in meta-analysis uh, a significant improvement in IPSS in line with what one would expect from a TURP or laser, as well as with improvements in flow rate, quality of life score, and post void residual improvement. Unique selling point of aquablation is that this all seems to be achieved at a much lower risk of negative impact upon sexual function, with anti-grade uh, ejaculation preserved in nearly 90% of patients to some degree or other, and erectile function apparently unchanged in all patients. This is then completely different from the previous uh, so-called gold standard resecting approaches, at least in terms of impact upon sexual function. So here we are in 2022, and as we've heard, uh, some of the limitations of the minimum invasive surgical treatments, and indeed, as we're aware from some of the more or so-called gold standard treatments, relates to the volume of prostate. And we know generally we're saying bigger and bigger prostates out there in terms of men presenting with bothersome lonely tract symptoms secondary to BPH. If we look in that so-called resecting group, then with TRP and green light laser uh, in guidelines are recommended for those prostates of small and medium size, perhaps up to 100 mils. But once we get much beyond that, then we start to see data backing in a, a nucleation approach be it uh, based around a laser or in even um, bipolar technology now, uh, but also uh, robotic assisted and open simple nephrectomies of old. All those procedures are aiming at prioritizing a significant improvement in symptoms and less concerned about the potential negative impact upon sexual function. We've heard today about these minimum invasive surgical treatments of Urolift and Resume, the so called non receptive approaches, and I think one can conclude that the priority of those procedures is to improve symptoms, but even more so to do so in a way that completely preserves sexual function, as well as being a minimally invasive experience for the patient in terms of rapid return to normal activity. So that in a world where the vast majority of men uh, are taking medication to try and improve their symptoms, and very few in fact end up undergoing surgical procedures, where would these minimally invasive surgical treatments sit? Are they a challenge to standard surgical procedures? Or are they in fact also an alternative to those uh, who may well uh, be offered medical therapy in the first instance with no other choice? So the arrival of these treatments options does represent a challenge for both the urologist and indeed for the patient. Do we have conversations? When, we're talk, when we are thinking about offering medical treatment to men about the potential role of minimally invasive surgical treatments? Or do we only talk to men about these uh, 
missed options when we're then also talking about the option of cavitating or receptive standard surgical approaches. If we are talking about surgery, it's really important that both the urologist and the patient fully understand the differences in process and outcome of the minimum invasive surgical treatments themselves, but also how that differs from the standard approaches. It's really important that we also understand there are differences in evidence base. It's good for urology, and it's great for patients, that technology means that newer treatment options are coming along all the time. But of course, they won't all have the same body of evidence behind them in terms of predictability and reassurance for the patient. And it's important that we all understand those differences so that we can communicate it to the patients when they're making their decisions. And now we do have to make a choice, a choice from potentially many options. And how do we make, help the patient make that choice in an efficient and effective manner? Certainly one idea is about one-stop BPH clinics, including the standard assessments with IPSS, flow rate and post flow residual volume measurement, but also is now noted in both the AUA and EAU guidelines, the importance of gaining information regarding prostate volume, and ideally also an idea as to the shape of the prostate as to the presence or otherwise of a middle lobe in particular. It is then that we can then find out what options are left on the table for the patient uh, based upon all that information, understanding the process of the, and, uh, of the procedures that have been previously discussed today. So for the management of symptomatic BPH in 2022, there are many different surgical options that have been established. In fact, there are others on the way. We are seeing the rebirth of the prostatic stent, be it in the form of the butterfly uh, or Zenflow spring. We're also uh, hearing about the potential arrival of Optilum in the management of symptomatic BPH. And there is a prospective trial versus sham uh, underway in the US looking at this. And we are seeing the rebirth of uh, other interstitial ablative approaches, including the use of lasers via the transperineal approach uh, and this was presented in the EA, EAU this year. The question that arises is, does the arrival of these minimum invasive surgical treatments uh, mean a change in established management paradigm? As I outlined, it's a question of when we start to discuss uh, the option of these surgical interventions as opposed to medical therapy or as opposed to standard surgical procedures. When we see a patient, we're now looking at, at an individualized approach to treatment based upon the patient needs in terms of what they need, the level of intervention required to improve their symptoms, what they expect in terms of the procedure, recovery, level of symptom improvement and impact upon sexual function. And wrapping this all up in the patient dynamics in terms of how obstructed they are, how good we think their bladder is as a muscle in terms of detrusive function, and most importantly, the size and shape of their prostate. All this means a more thorough evaluation, including understanding the size and shape of the prostate, more discussion with the patient, and essentially more time spent with the patient uh, trying to make the right decision for them. Indeed, I will leave you the question asking that the, the field of uh, surgical intervention for symptomatic BPH now is so crowded and so complicated and, is look, and will almost certainly become more so as more technology comes along over the next few years, is the management of symptomatic BPH almost becoming its own subspeciality? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your perfect presentation. We have still some minutes for the discussion. I want to ask Basidon the questions that we have received on the platform uh, to Ms. Ray regarding the concern that several urologists have posed in our uh, course regarding the risk of bleeding during the upablation techniques. Just a quick response. In case of patients under anticoagulant, patient at risk of bleeding, do you feel confident with upablation or not? No, I think all, in the, all is in the, the decision-making process. In fact, um, patients taking oral anticoagulants are, have usually um, not a good uh, sexual function. So IF5 score is not really uh, high. So uh, initially, uh, aquablation was um, designed to uh, offer the patient the opportunity to preserve ejaculation. Um, and of course, 
to benefit from a, a deal obstruction surgery. So patients under anti oral anticoagulant, anti antithrombotic agents are uh, usually cardiac stents or uh, anyway, so they, they um, the, 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 the end point is not uh, for this, these patients uh, uh, to preserve absolutely an integral uh, uh, ejaculation because they don't have a, a very good sexual function at baseline. So it's not a common problem I encounter uh, on, on uh, routinely. So, but to, to answer the question, um, I don't recommend to, to, to use the, the, to offer aquablation uh, uh, in patients taking antithrombotic agents because of the risk of bleeding, of course. Um, but to, to prevent the risk of bleeding, you can simply cauterize the uh, the the the, the, uh, uh, the bladder neck uh, if you see bleeders uh, when the procedure is over and you look in the prosthetic fossa if there is any bleeders uh, before putting the catheter uh, in. Okay. Regarding uh, the other presentation, uh, I would like to ask to Dr. Barber. You present uh, the two extreme uh, data. The very first is the pulsar study regarding the Eurolift. So use uh, Eurolift for very severe patients. I mean, patients under acute urinary retention. And you present the LIFT study that demonstrate that Eurolift can be used in an office setting. So the question is in patients under acute urinary retention, do you think that the Eurolift can be managed also in this case, uh, in office setting. Yes, I don't. I don't see. In terms of the procedure itself, it doesn't change the approach in terms of anesthesia. Um, if anything, they're more tolerant of a twenty French cystoscope being passed down the urethra than the man who hasn't had a catheter in for a period of time. Um, so I don't see any difference in terms of process within that trial. I was one of the centres in Pulsar, and the, within the protocol, we left the catheter in. Uh, for two weeks before getting them back and taking it out you know that was just creating a a, 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 a protocol but i do you know there's some ev there's some sense behind that in terms of you know you are doing a not aggressive and unaggressive disobstructing procedure and you want to squeak everything out of it that you can to give them the best chance to avoid so, and and we all know the longer you leave things after in, in men with it who have had catheters the better the chance they will avoid so that, i do follow that I'm, i must say it's not driven it's a bit like the same thing with anti anticoagulants and men in aquablation which i share completely Vincent's opinion with having you know been doing this for a while as well and from the urolift point of view again you know it's not that many men we're driving you know we're driving towards choosing urolift as an option when they're presenting in urinary retention they want a more predictable you know that 75 percent or 80 percent isn't higher and they're looking to get rid of their catheter and they're often men again who won't be particularly be attracted by the concept of Eurolift, give, you know, in terms of its avoidance of impact upon sexual function. So there are men where it can play a role, and we have some data, reasonably quality, although it, uh, not randomised, but multi-centred prospective at least, um, suggesting that it does work if you choose your patients carefully, uh, and then those patients are willing to accept that uh, you know that um, they will have by no means a guarantee they will avoid. Perfect. Thank you very much. So. Just uh, the last questions for both. Just uh, uh, say yes or no, both please, to the questions. The majority of urologists have several concerns regarding the minimal invasive procedure, regarding the durab durability of this procedure, and the risk of retreatment. Do you think that there are, uh, they must be confident that uh, if uh, the treatment uh, with minimal invasive approach failure, the retreatment with standard surgical procedure can be performed without any problem. Neil, Vincent, what do you think? Uh, I think it's not a problem to go through a uh, standard procedure after failure of a minimum invasive surgical procedure. So it uh, allows to, for the patients to uh, pass uh, some years um, with, uh, um, uh, uh, without uh, LUTs and maybe with a good preservation of a sexual function and thereafter um, to go through to a standard procedure to a more complete disobstruction uh, to think about the, the durability uh, um, uh, at this point. Neil? I would, I would agree and, and I think that you know the, 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 this is all about how this conversation changes with men and who 
which men are coming to see us about their waterworks at what point in their lives and also what their expectations are in terms of their quality of life now and going forward and that balance of what's important to them we just heard right at the beginning of Anson's thoughts about that paper which really demonstrated something which perhaps urologists haven't really opened their eyes to that how important men think it is yes they want to see an improvement in their waterworks but they don't want to see it definitively at a high risk or indeed total risk of losing some other important functions to them and we've just kind of signed that off previously and men have basically talked and walked and chosen they will they will make that choice and they obviously they need to make it with eyes wide open they need to know that you there is a cost to be paid and that is the degree of efficacy and longevity there's no doubt that i would look in my patient's eye and say you know it will not last as long uh, and you you may well be back uh, for further treatment but that does also include redo you know i've had a number of people now you know i've been doing urolift for eight years and you know who have come back five six years who've said they want it again and uh that's fine and the uh, but and but particularly as vassal said there's been a whole bunch of questions on the q a none of these procedures including urolift or resume precludes you having a standard approach the only thing with urolift to be aware of if you're in a nucleator is uh, to watch out for those urethral end pieces because if you if you enucleate and they're they're left in the mass of tissue that you're then going to morselate they will break your expensive morselator, so so that's the only thing to be aware of. But aquablation, for instance, again, a lot of men I've had have chosen to move with bigger prostates really than perhaps they should have done for a urolift have gone on to have aquablation, not a problem. At the same time as you achieve the hemostasis at the end you just take off the implants and yet they're still maintaining erectile function and having this very low risk of dry ejaculation so they're still kind of getting what they want yeah perfect thank you very much so i think that it was uh, an amazing session we have joined uh, more than 270 colleagues and i think that our topic is due also to the fact that, that this minimal invasive procedure can be determined now and in the next years uh, to manage the problem uh, with the waiting list, with the problem with the recovery that in all urological departments are related to the COVID waves. So every uh, urological department across Europe and maybe all over the world are at uh, half of their normal activity due to the problem and the restriction due to the COVID pandemic. So to have in our armamentarium a new some new devices like this one to manage DPH, to manage LATS, to manage acute urinary retention, I think is very determinant. So I want to thank you very much, uh, uh, European School of Urology, European Association of Urology for this meeting. I want uh, to thank uh, Dr. Barber and Dr. Misray that joined me uh, to this session. And finally, I want to thank Teleflex that they supported this event. So thank you everyone and have a good evening.